welcome. Uh, uh, and, and with me right now is Brian Porter, director of Attempt Number One here at the Valley Film Festival. <laughs> An amazing short film uh, that Thank I think you. everybody is going to want to see and, and enjoy. Uh, Brian, how are you? How are you doing? I'm great. I mean, thus far, yeah, it's going it's going really well. Obviously, we're kind of go we continue to go into new COVID elements, but I've been able to do a lot of like uh, voiceover and writing and stuff like that from home. And so this is workspace, and it's been super casual. Plus, I got two cats here, so the cats are <laughs> you know I got the moral support of two furry animals. You're never alone in COVID if you got your animals with you. Uh, it's so true. That's a beautiful yeah. sentence. Yeah, uh, whether they're there or not, right? Sometimes yeah. you don't know. It's uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I want you to tell everybody watching uh, what is uh, attempt number one about. What is what is your film about? Yes, it. I would say that it is a whimsical short film about a man who will go to great lengths to be reunited with his cat. Um, so essentially, it's a guy who his cat has gone, it's passed away, it's not around anymore, and he, he has a hunch that there's a parallel universe off the edge of the apartment plexus roof, and so he's going to, he devises a plan to ride a bicycle off the roof to go into the parallel universe to try to get his cat back. That makes complete logical sense. I think we all agree that we would do all do the same thing if uh, yes, yes, yes. it passes. Um, I, I love your film. Uh, it's it, there's a lyrical quality to it. Um, it's it, it's very well shot. As I understand it, you shot this during COVID, during a, one of the many lockdowns. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we're in one still. It's always hard to tell. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but but how'd that go? How did it go shooting on your own? Um, Dude, it was it was stellar, and truthfully, it was um it was such a like a, a creative hobby sort of way of putting it together. Where I I found. I, had, I lived at that the complex where I filmed it. It's a beautiful 1930s Art Deco building. And I found out that I had to leave. And so, and I had managed the apartment complex actually. Um, and so I was the only one who had roof access. And I was like, this place is gorgeous. I have to film something up here. And so I went into my closet and put a kooky outfit together. And I was like, wouldn't it be weird to have just a bicycle on top of a rooftop? Like that's an interesting stakes, you know? And so I went up in the outfit and I took a couple of just long shots of me in that outfit, kind of just being perky. Um, and then I looked at the footage and it looked gorgeous and uh, the characters seemed really interesting. And so then from there, I kind of devised a storyline around it. Um, and then I shot the whole thing myself. So it was literally just on a stand that I would sit in different places. And um, it was it was so much fun. And then to see that it actually came together into something I was really proud of. I was like, oh, wow, the universe really does just like let art speak sometimes. So, yeah, it was cool. I love that you were inspired by by creating the character first and. Uh, and seeing it and then and then having that you do that a lot with your with your shorts do you do you, come you know up with, I haven't I have it with film because uh, this was actually my first thing that I produced ever um, which was awesome and then I, I consequently produced something like three months after it because I got the bug you know um, but I have a background in uh, clowning like serious clowning um, they call it the Lecoq method um, but that's all of devising characters based off of just um, kind of basic human characteristics and and um, Kind of eliminating ideas of what you think are funny and just kind of existing in in emotions and stuff like that it's all it's all very highbrow and yet it's so many fart jokes um but uh that's kind of the basis of how i came together with the character so i've devised characters before that kind of just like come from me sitting in a room thinking like hmm, well, wouldn't this be interesting but this is the first film that i've done that kind of took advantage of that character development so it was, uh, uh, you know, it's very well shot. And what's your background in, in shooting? And um, did you go to film school? Was it something that, because I know you're an actor, but and obviously a clown. Um, yeah, yeah, obviously. As right. you just revealed. Um, uh, but, but did you did you have a background in, in, in shooting before at all? Uh, no. So I, you know, I grew up in uh, Minnesota, which is similar to, to some of these other small markets like Atlanta and stuff, had a, a really great film and TV community in that space. And so I, did a lot of theater out there, but then interacted with the kind of film and TV departments and stuff like that. And because it's a smaller market, there was such a, we're all in this together mentality on any project that you worked with film wise over there. And so I think that's kind of just consequently how I started to appreciate how shots were framed and stuff like that. Um, but I, I had never shot anything in particular. Obviously I love movies and um, I'm a big like um, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson fan. And so I love his camera work. Um, but I also love just the standard performance styles of people like uh, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. And 
I kind of looking at the, the space where I wanted to film, thought that, you know, just kind of static shots was first, number one, the only thing that I could do because I didn't have anybody else in the team. So I had to do that. But to just kind of take advantage of like the kind of old school mentality of the camera can't do a lot of work and the the just single shot kind of needs to to sell the whole thing. And so, uh, no, it was my first foray into to filming and shooting, uh, but it, it looks beautiful. It does. Uh, but it's not it's it's not because of me. It's just because the, the space is so profoundly um, beautiful. So, well, you mentioned Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and, you know, I, I, you have these beautiful vistas of L.A. and on the rooftop. Uh, I, I know that view quite well. Um, and, 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 and I've been on top of some of those Art Deco buildings. I lived in one in Koreatown for some time. Uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, and I've, I've, you know, shot there as well. <laughs> it's tempting, uh -huh. but you're shooting in a place that, I mean, I think, you know, this, right. Uh, that is where, you know, Buster Keaton and, and, and Charlie Chaplin shot and, and, uh, you know, it, it's some of their work, you know, in that, those same vistas, uh, so I, I, it makes sense to me that you're that you were able to sort of uh, 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 call back to those films. What I what I love about your movie is it feels very much like uh, I know you mentioned like French New Wave or something. You know, for me, it it, uh, it feels more like a a Moliere film or uh, you oh, know, sure. when he's, you know, where the trip to the moon where you see everything and they walk you through it and then you have it. Uh, you know, it, it, except it's all just you instead of uh, um, a whole bunch of people. Uh, yeah, running. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love to have you. Did you, are you a fan of silent film? Like, how did you, is it the clowning? Is that how you? you yeah, I think it was mostly the clowning that kind of had me go to it. And then I, um, I, I was hired to do a Charlie Chaplin impersonation for a, a video thing about three years ago um, and just saw how it came out really interesting. And I had so much fun doing it. But more profoundly, it's something where people, watched it and they said oh my god you are a dead ringer for charlie chaplin you were so exactly like him and i was like really because i didn't study much charlie chaplin and then i went back and i, I watched the charlie chaplin videos and truthfully i'm not very charlie chaplin i don't do anything similar to what charlie chaplin does it's just it being a black and white thing and doing kooky faces and stuff people go like oh this is totally charlie chaplin <laughs> so i went back and i was like you know i'm not i'm not a dead ringer for this particular guy for specific mannerisms and stuff like that but the sort of tramp-like character that those characters play was something that um, is an archetype that I had done with clowning. And so I think that that's kind of what initially attracted me to it. And then of course I watched a bunch of black and white films. Um, I actually had a, um, a segment probably about a month where I spent a lot of time watching black and white films because I was um, working with a virtual reality company to maybe put together a black and white virtual reality experience with this thing. And that didn't end up coming to fruition for several reasons, but I kind of sat on this character for such a long time. And then a year and a half later, it just kind of happened to come out when I was filming this thing. So, uh, and 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 there's uh, there's the cat. There's the uh, what, 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 tell everyone the cat's name in, in in life and in the film. Yes, this is Dorian. This is Dorian to play Schrodinger in the film. Yeah, such a cute guy, right, buddy? Well, it's cool. good. It's good to see that he <laughs> that he exists indeed. Yeah, he's real. Yeah, he's real. He's still alive. He, no cat was hurt in the making of the film. He's both in uh, in this universe and, and not in this universe, I guess, right? Isn't I mean, uh, yeah, supposedly. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, I have one question after watching your short. Did the, the camera really keep falling? Is that just... A, oh, like, yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, as you mentioned, these Koreatown complexes, it was like a, a six-story complex and there were no other buildings around. And so on the rooftop, the wind was just insane. And that's actually a large portion of why it ended up being... Uh, a silent film is because all of the audio was completely unusable. <laughs> like I tried giving this guy a voice and kind of speaking and stuff like that. Um, he, he almost seemed like uh, like Rick from Rick and Morty when I was speaking. Um, but then I, the audio just wasn't good for the rooftop stuff. And I thought it was just better silent, but yeah, it did keep falling. Uh, and it just, it ended up working for the characters. Yeah, it was fun. I, I love that you're, you follow that instinct of, of, you know, of going, these limitations aren't really going to help me. And instead of giving up, you embraced them, leaned into them and made it uh, even, you know, made, made the project, I think, uh, even better. I don't, I don't know if it would work if he spoke. I think it's better as a silent film. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. And thank you. Yeah, man. That's, a, that's what I came to in editing. I was like, yeah, this guy's way quirkier when you just kind of you think about what his voice is going to be. Or, yeah, or then you, and then you know, like you know, like you think about Chaplin. You know, the the tramp didn't speak for about thirty years, yeah, uh, until the the uh, great dictator. I think was the first time he ever spoke. Mm -hmm. um, and then he gives this amazing speech. So you, you know, you see, he sets the bar pretty high for yeah. silent, you know, characters. If they speak, they got to do something amazing. Uh, but even that was like, oh, that's his voice. Huh. 
You yeah, know? go like, figure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that he was, uh, I mean, I don't want to say lucky because he was so talented, but thank God it did work out so well. The Great Dictator and his voice did support that monologue and stuff so well because they'll be remembered as being good, you know. I know that there were several other silent film stars that, yeah, did, they struggled in the transition. Well, you know, we, we talk a lot in filmmaking that, you know, it's a visual medium. It's, you know, it's visual storytelling. Like, I, I don't know if you took any film classes, but, you know, when you're learning the, the, the craft, you know, they don't, they sometimes don't let you even have dialogue because they want you to learn to, to, to make things visually. Um, and, I, and I think you did that in, in a very masterful way. And, and I applaud you. That was, it was uh, very clear, very engaging and, uh, and inspiring. And, uh, you know, and I got a, I got a, got a little emotionally caught up in it. It was. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you. It's weird because the way that it, even just with the end credit scene, it, it ended up having a little bit of like a, a Pixar short film quality to it as well. That just feels yeah. very, and actually I think a lot of the work of the emotional work is actually just the, the um, music that I use, you know, which is such a great Chopin piece that like, of course Chopin is amazing, you know? Yeah. So if you have any sort of visual that feels like it kind of coincides and goes with it, like um, it's a little scientifically put together to, to create an emotional response, so. Did yeah. you pick the music um, yeah, uh, uh, as you were editing is, or was it something? Yeah, that you... yeah. So I would say that definitely, I think I, I kind of landed on the music when I had maybe 80% of the film made and then did the zhuzhing to make sure that it lines up with, you know, music arcs and stuff like that. Because, you know, there's, there's a big things like, I, I won't ruin it, but when he's kind of going full force on the bicycle and about to go off the rooftop and stuff like you had to make I had to make sure that that lined up with the music kind of you know releasing into this climax and stuff and so to judge those little seconds around required a couple of like reshoots of segments and stuff but I also found that it's like uh you know when you when you uh, touch the rose of wilts or whatever the the metaphor is I I would do a sequence and I go like oh that was great and so quirky and natural but I need to do that and have to be three seconds longer. And then I would try to refilm it and I just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to capture it, you know? Um, so it's funny to see myself as the actor going like, oh yeah, sometimes really the first moment, like you can't remake it. it that is really true. And I think that's a good lesson in, in, in filmmaking, you know, is, uh, you know, whenever you do multiple takes, you know, there needs to be a reason for it. And in yeah. my mind, sometimes when I'm shooting, I'll have a, a, my, you know, actors will do it a great take. i like, that was great. Let's see if we can do it again. And maybe it'll be better. And then, then three or four takes after that, you're like, well, now we're just <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, now it's yeah. a shadow of what it once was. Yeah. <laughs> um, why did you become a filmmaker? What uh, what made you go? And I know this is your first first one. Why why was it just the shutdown, or was it, you know, and you, you got into clowning and all that? What kind of got you into into this world? Yeah. Of yeah. Well, I've certainly always been interested in filmmaking as as an actor and, and that being a thing, and I've always been interested in character driven pieces, which is big as well. Um, and I would say that I um as a performer kind of always knew that i wanted to devise my own work or create my own work or collaborate on creating um, original projects but i couldn't you, you know it's a, it, it's all the procrastination and all the uh you know i'll write at the end of the day and the end of the day it comes and you just watch some tv and smoke some weed or something like that you know and uh and so i it never happened but then and i was doing so much theater work um and theater work was great and really fills my soul but as soon as covid hit theater work particularly was just gone you know um, and so I think that's kind of what made me turn around to focusing on what sort of a project that I would want to make. Um, and, you know, I kind of go back to this Elizabeth Gilbert concept of, uh, that she brings up in Big Magic, where um, you should follow your curiosity um, and not put financial pressure on your creativity. I put so much financial pressure on my being an actor. Like, I'm, I'm like, if I'm not making money doing it, I'm clearly not a successful actor, which is, a, you know, a bullshit mentality. But when it came to filmmaking, I was like, well, I'm not claiming to be a filmmaker. And so I can make this and just, you know, do it with, with whatever love and joy I have for the craft and just enjoy it and do it for myself. Um, and I think ironically out of that came what felt to me a very, um, uh, a very authentic, honest feeling, vulnerable piece of work. Um, so I think uh, what drew me to filmmaking is I really just as an artist, quote unquote artist, I think everybody can make art, but um, I think what drew me to it is that I just wanted to make something that was my own for the first time ever. Um, and to see how it really is kind of a weird reflection of my, my own quirkiness is, is beautiful. So I'm addicted now. Yeah. I, I, I loved it and, and I, I appreciate it a great deal. Uh, and, uh, and doing it during COVID, and it certainly expresses what that feels like too. 
you know, it, I, you know, we were all going through this strange shared experience of being alone, um, yeah. you know, which, is, which is an odd uh, juxtaposition. Uh, and, and I think your film kind of, in some strange way, also captures that. You know, you mentioned in, sure. in your in, in your write up that uh, that you wrote into the, the the festival, you know, that it was shot during COVID and all this, and that it um, was shot in isolation and all that. But I, it also expresses kind of this desire for everybody, if you want to get metaphorical about it. Uh, yeah. Of, coming back together and you know and and, and i don't want to give away anything in the film because people are gonna have to watch it um but uh but i appreciate that you, you've made i think i think you've touched on something very important in that when you follow your heart as an artist and you just do it for the sake of telling whatever story it is that's coming out of you it, i think it, it results in something a little bit better instead of aiming for oh i need to make you know i need this to be the big hit that launches yeah. my face on a you know uh, by the way, what what film inspires you? Like, what do you watch um, that get you going? Uh, did, did you, you know, I know you watched some silent films for, you know, some of this. But like, what is your like? If you're gonna make a film or 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 get inspired to write, what what is it you turn on and, and watch? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, anything that is character driven is the thing that I am I am most like just love. Um, and I think even character driven stuff, it's kind of exists upon, across the board of like formulaic writing and stuff. Like I just finished watching Doom Patrol on HBO, which I never thought that I would be into the DC's universe. Um, but Doom Patrol is this kind of under the radar, like we're not the big superheroes. And so we can have these quirks and stuff like that. And I found it to be some of the most compelling superhero stuff that I've watched because um, it, because it's not these huge archetypes of like, you know, the Avengers and, or, um, or Justice League and stuff they're actually able to explore just personal quirks and nuance within these characters that most people aren't familiar with. So I love that. Um, as I mentioned to you, Paul Thomas Anderson is probably my favorite um, filmmaker. Um, and Quentin Tarantino is obviously phenomenal as well. And while both of those um, filmmakers are extremely visual, um, what I love is they're extremely visual, but they're not CGI based. And, and everything that they do is still so, um, nuanced in character and really relies upon the actors to bring a, a certain presence to the to the performances to, to really be successful and so anything that I can watch that I feel like the performance is something that um, that particular actor is bringing something to it that it's not just somebody going like oh oh here's a dead body officer you know um, which my heart goes out today because you know I, I I need as many of those roles as I can as an actor as well um, but to see work that really allows um, actors and other creatives to really um, dive in and feel out uh, the message and the story that they're trying to deliver. I think that's what I'm attracted to as a as a viewer. And I think as a as a, as a performer too, it's it, it, I definitely see it. You know, when you, when you look at those movies of of P. T. Anderson or uh, or Tarantino, what you see is that you know you look at the character and you kind of you see a story because they're so specific. And how they create character that it they yeah about that character how they frame them and i look at your film and and i see that too so i i think you've definitely succeeded thank uh, you well, well thank you brian for for talking with us and congratulations on being in the valley film festival yeah uh, i'm super hyped i can't wait to go and it's it's going to be amazing and folks if you want to watch brian's film uh there'll be a link i believe somewhere below me or to the side of me or above me or wherever this video frame is uh it's called attempt number one please watch it uh it is uh it's fantastic uh and brian again thank you so much for uh for taking time to talk to us yes thank you david appreciate you man